All right, Genesis chapter 18. Genesis 18. In chapter 17, Abraham and Sarah had their names changed. God told them the son of promise would come through Sarah and not Hagar, and they were to be about one year from that time. He also instituted circumcision, and we know that this chapter takes place shortly after chapter 17. We know that from the text of uh, 18, 19, 20, 21. We know that this was... Uh, probably days or weeks uh, after chapter 17. So we're going to begin in verse 1. Then the Lord appeared to him by the terebinth tree of Mamre. And as he was sitting in the tent door in the heat of the day, so he lifted his eyes and looked, and behold, three men were standing by him. And when he saw them, he ran from the tent door to meet them and bowed himself to the ground. The Lord appeared to Abraham by the terebinth tree. The God of heaven and earth here takes on human form and he meets with Abraham. It's a remarkable thing that Abraham gets to have this conversation in person with the Lord. One day we will all get to see his face. One day we will all get this privilege. But Abraham got it even while he was here. I also want to remind you that the same God who met with Abraham wants to meet with you, and he wants to meet with me daily. Every day, the Lord wants to meet with his children. Revelation chapter 3, verse 20, Jesus is talking to the church of Laodicea, the lukewarm church, and he says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him, and he with me. How awesome is that, that God wants to fellowship with you and me? I want to remind you as we kind of look at our text here this morning, too, of the first and greatest commandment. Love God. First and greatest, meaning that after you're saved, if you understand one thing in life, understand this. The chief purpose now in your life is love God and enjoy being loved by Him. This relationship with God is now the most important thing in your life. That's what that means. And God wants a personal relationship with each of us. You know, we see in the life of Abraham, we see he had some moments of incredible faith, and we see sometimes he stumbled. And whenever we see these times uh, that he meets with the Lord, there's these incredible things that are happening. It's these testimonies. It's when we see that his eyes are focused on the problems that he gets himself in a little bit of trouble, or even in good things, right? When he wants his son in chapter 17, and they're, and they're making plans. Well, you know, if, if Sarah can't get pregnant, we'll get a surrogate mother. And they start making these different plans. It's only when his eyes are off the Lord that we see that he has problems. But when his eyes are, are on the Lord, in these times where he meets with the Lord, we see this incredible faith in Abraham. And I think there's an invaluable lesson for us in keeping our eyes on the Lord. And in verse 2, it says, So Abraham lifted his eyes and looked, and behold, three men were standing by him. And when he saw them, he ran from the tent door to meet them and bowed himself to the ground. Jewish tradition says this was three days after Abraham was circumcised. And so this running was probably physically unenjoyable. (laughs) But... uh, It could have been a few weeks later. It wasn't very far. We know it's not very far because we have a time clock of one year. There's going to be a baby, and we have events that we know take time between uh, even when Sarah gets pregnant here over the next few chapters. And so we know this had to take place fairly shortly after it. And again, tradition says three, but we don't have that confirmed in in the word. And it says he bowed himself to the ground. What a fitting response when you go to meet with the Lord. Verse 3, Abraham said, My Lord, if I have found favor in your sight, do not pass on by your servant. Please let let a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree. And I'll bring a morsel of bread that you may refresh your hearts. After that, you may pass by and as much as you have come to your servant. They said, Do as you have said. 
Now, you may be wondering how I'm so certain that this uh, person that Abraham is talking with is the Lord. And again, in verse 1, it says, the Lord appeared to him. And then as Abraham approaches these men, he says, my Lord or my Adonai, which is a name that is only used for God. It means my Lord or the Lord of all. And so we have the, the word uh, Adon or the word Lord. There was a general sense that people could use uh, of any different person, but the word Adonai is used for God, like the Lord of all, instead of just Lord. Uh, several, com or not commentators, but uh, dictionaries, essentially the Greek, confirm that Strong says this name is used exclusively for God. A quote from the Theological Dictionary of the Old Testament says, a man did not desire to call on his Lord when he used Adonai, but on the Lord, undoubtedly. Uh, the Complete Word Study Dictionary of the Old Testament says, Adonai, a masculine noun used exclusively of God. An emphatic form of the word Adon. This word means literally, my Lord, is often used in place of the divine name, Y-H-W-H. Whenever you're reading through your Bible, you see the word Lord, all four letters are capitalized. That means they're substituting that word in the, in the Hebrew, it's the letters Y-H-W-H, the name of God. And this word was one that they would often use in place of saying it as well. Adonai. So he recognizes right away, Abraham knows that these three men, though it is God in human form, uh, they're not normal men. He recognizes that immediately. I don't know why. I don't know if they look different. I don't know if they just appeared or if it was the spirit inside him that could recognize him. But there was something that shows that he clearly knew. And he says, if I have now found favor in your sight... Do not pass on by your servant. You know, we see here that the Lord came to Abraham, but Abraham also ran to God. And he asked him to come to his tent or his home. And how about you this morning? I have that question. Is God welcome at your home? Is he welcome in your heart? Remember what Jesus said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And so that comes to a question to us this morning. Are you running to answer it? Are you running to meet him? Are you sitting on the couch saying, I know who's there. Where are you? Are you asking him to come in? Are you looking to be with him? Is he the honored guest? Look at the way Abram treats him. Verse 4, please let a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree. And I will bring a morsel of bread that you may refresh your hearts. After that, you may pass by and as much as you have come to your servant. They said, do as you have said. We see the hospitality of Abraham. Now, if you read some history of this time, it would seem that hospitality was more common in these days than it was in our time. Uh, but that's not something that is an excuse or something we like. We obviously see Abraham is treating these guests with greater hospitality than even a normal guest would have in that time. But men of God should always be hospitable in any time as they live. Why? Because the first commandment is to love God and the second is to love your neighbor. God should always be welcome with you in your home and so should guests. Why? Because we need to love them. So men of God must be hospitable. How can you love someone if you're not even willing to be friendly? I want you to notice how Abraham again greets these three men. In the next chapter, we won't get there this morning, but we'll see how Lot greets the two angels. Again, very hospitable. And then this, the men of Sodom, how they greet the two angels. The men of Sodom only want to abuse and use the strangers. They have no hospitality, only looking for gratifying their own flesh. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 2 reminds us, Do not forget to entertain strangers, for by so doing, some have unwittingly entertained angels. We should be loving and caring and opening our homes to one another for, for fellowship. Again, this is not talking about just of a communal living or something of that nature. It's about loving your neighbor. Meaning it doesn't mean you need to be a doormat for people to walk on. It means you need to be hospitable. 
Overall, as a church, I believe overall that actually a lot of you do very well in the area of hospitality. Several of you have people over regularly, uh, and that's a great thing. It's something we want to continue to grow in as a church. In the last few months, I know several people have been out sick, and lots of you have uh, come around them, provided meals, and been praying for each other. These are wonderful things, and I pray that we continue to grow in these things more and more. I appreciate that love in this body, but I also believe we need to strive to grow in it more and more, not just become, well, that's that's enough. We need to continue to grow in hospitality. If you don't feel that you're particularly good at hospitality, a great place to start is praying and asking God to help you to be good at being hospitable. Ask him, say, Lord, teach me to be uh, hospitable. Teach me to be generous. Teach me to be a loving host. If you've never invited anyone to your home, I want to encourage you this morning to change that. Get to know your brothers and sisters in Christ and our community. Get to know other people, neighbors, different people. Uh, Most of our city, we even know as far as being hospitable in our area, this whole area, even most of us uh, probably here in this room have moved here in the last five years. There's not a whole lot of deep-rooted relationships in these communities because these communities are predominantly new. Most of the people in these areas haven't lived here that long. And I want to encourage you guys to, uh, to be hospitable to each other. So many people in life are lonely. And we can grow in our hospitality and our love for others. And when we do that, we gain influence and an ability to encourage people in the Lord or to help bring them to the Lord. It's through those different conversations that you get opportunities to minister to others. And it's also in those conversations, also oftentimes, that you find yourself ministered to. Think about how many good things in your life have started because somebody invited you to a meal. Or because you invited some people to a meal. And the conversations and the friendships that were started. What value there is in being hospitable. Practically speaking, figure out a time and invite someone over. If you're not good at schedule, you go, well, I don't know where to start. It's pretty simple. You pick a night that works for you, uh, like after church like this or something, you just walk up to another family and say, what are you guys doing Thursday night? And invite them over. Uh, meet with the kids at the park. If you're not comfortable quite yet having people maybe in your home, you don't know these people very well, and uh, try to meet with them at a park. I think you're getting the idea that we should be investing in each other's lives. We should be trying to get to know each other. And when you do get together, do your best to be a good host, to love the people that come into your home. You may develop a great friendship. You may entertain angels, and you may meet someone crazy. (laughs) And so use discernment, of course, of the Spirit. Uh, If God doesn't give you peace about someone in your home, in all seriousness, you know, use wisdom. You got kids and stuff at home. Uh, Have safety. And you can meet people in a safe place if you have a a discerning in your spirit about people. But otherwise, be hospitable. Don't let fear keep you from connecting with the body. Verse 6. So Abraham hurried into the tent to Sarah and said, Quickly, make ready three measures of fine meal. Knead it and make cakes. And Abraham ran to the herd and took a tender and good calf, gave it to the young man, and he hastened to prepare it. So he took butter and milk in the calf, which he had prepared, and set it before them. And he stood by them under the trees as they ate. Again here, we see haste in Abraham. He is running. He is doing his best as he has this time with the Lord. What are you running after this morning? Three measures, it says, were uh, given here of, of Bread, and that's much more than what was needed. It's like 21 to 30 quarts of bread. If you want to have an idea what that is, I use like one quart of flour when I make pizza for my whole family, seven people. It's like four and a half cups per quart of flour, maybe another quart of water. So like two quarts tops for feeding enough for like seven people. So this is a ton of bread for some reason that he made for these people. There's an abundance of food. Of course, he slaughtered a calf. We see that this is a more of a feast that he's presenting than a common meal. He also provided more than he originally offered 
to his guest, uh, and he hand-selected the calf. So we see that he is involved in all the preparations of these things, and he is moving to make them happen quickly. Remember, he's like 99 years old <laughs> as he's running around doing these things. Then they said to him, where is Sarah, your wife? So he said, here in the tent, and he said, I will certainly return to you according to the time of life. And behold, Sarah, your wife, shall have a son. Sarah was listening to the tent door, which was behind him. Well, God knew where Sarah was when he asked the question. He was simply turning attention now to her. He says something similar to what he told Abraham in chapter 17. Perhaps he wanted Sarah to hear it. In chapter 17, verse 21, he said, My covenant I will establish with Isaac, whom Sarah shall bear to you at this time next year. So Sarah, it says, was listening in the tent door, which was behind him. It seemed the Lord wanted her to hear it also from him. As I'm, as I'm reading this too, I'm just thinking you know, about my wife. I'm a women love to know what's going on. Right, <laughs> sitting behind the tent door, tent door listening. <laughs> like I can totally see this. Not not much has changed in four thousand years. <laughs> Verse eleven. Now Abraham and Sarah were old, well advanced in age, and Sarah had passed the age of childbearing. Therefore Sarah laughed within herself, saying, "After I have grown old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord, being old also?" And the Lord said to Abraham, "Why did Sarah laugh?" saying, Shall I surely bear a child since I am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the appointed time, I will return to you according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. But Sarah denied it, saying, I did not laugh, for she was afraid. And he said, No, but you did laugh. <laughs> if you recall in chapter 17, Abraham also laughed when God told him he was going to have a son with Sarah. And as Sarah hears it from God, she laughs. It would seem that she did not laugh out loud, but out loud, but only inside her head. And again, Isaac's name means laughter. So God uh, treats it pretty lightly. He puts a pun in his name. You guys want to laugh when I tell you this? Guess what your kid's name is? Laughter. You guys will remember this every time you call your son for the rest of your lives. <laughs> uh, but Sarah laughed within herself. Another insight we should always be grabbing from uh, the text, as we read these things, there's these things that are clearly implied here, is that God hears every word spoken in our heads, and he knows every thought we think. It's a very uh, sobering thought, isn't it? Genesis chapter 6, verse 5, it said, Then the Lord saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. When we look at the time of the flood, you know, we go, what is, what was, it was that the world was evil, and you're saying their thoughts were evil continually. The things they dwelt on. Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 10 says, I, the Lord, search the heart. I test the mind, even to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his doings. God knows our thoughts and our motives. He sees why we do or do not do things. He knows when our heart is full of love or lust, doubt or faith, worry or rest. He knows your thought life and mine. So not acting, one thing we learned to pull from this, of course, is not acting on a sinful idea is good, but not even dwelling on it is better taking the thought captive, and casting it out. He says, at the appointed time, I will return to you. This again shows it was very close time-wise to the previous chapter, is that God told them that they would have a son within one year. Remember uh, last week too, we talked about Sarah's desire for a child and Abram's desire for a child, but to wait for the appointed time. And we see here that God's timing makes them laugh. Sarah's past childbearing means she no longer has a menstrual cycle. She's gone through menopause. And so the timing of God and the timing of man 
is usually way different. And we see that as God reveals himself to Abram, who is a man of God, and Sarah, who is a woman of God, and he tells them his plans, that their first reaction is laugh. And how important it is that we understand that God's thoughts are not our thoughts, his ways are not our ways. He is far superior in his understanding, and he is far wiser in his planning than we are. And God says to them, is anything too hard, or it could be translated too wonderful for the Lord? When we pray or talk with God or look at our world, we should not limit God's response to things that would only have a natural explanation. God had promised them a child. I think they both thought, well, obviously that ship sailed. It's got to be through the surrogate mother. It's got to be through Ishmael because I can't even have kids anymore. And I think sometimes we can have similar things in our prayer life that we can stop praying for things when we don't see a, a tangible way for it to be accomplished. If we can't see a path, we're like, well, the Lord's, he, you know, he's not going to do anything now. And is anything too hard, too wonderful for the Lord? Again, at the human perspective, this, this is happening at the wrong stage of life, at the wrong time. But for God, this is exactly when he planned it. Verse 15, Sarah said, I did not laugh, for she was afraid. And he said, no, but you did laugh. Sarah was afraid probably because she knew he heard her thoughts. That's a little bit, you know, imagine if you're thinking something and somebody can read your mind and they answer, that gets your attention, wouldn't it? <laughs> uh, she denies the action, but the Lord does not accept her cover-up. He simply states the truth. I think that there's two purposes, at least, in the reason he responds to her and is, and is talking with her about this. One is to, for her to understand the person she's talking with is divine. He can see her thoughts. And the other is to cause uh, some repentance in, in her mind, to control your thoughts. Isaiah chapter 55, verse 7 says, Let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord, and have mercy on him, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5 says, Casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. It's so important for us to learn how to control our thought life. I think at times we can think nobody knows what goes on in our head, but God knows. And he takes the, these actions very literal, as we see with Sarah. She might have only laughed inside, but God says, hey, you laugh. He says the same thing, right? If you look at a woman with lust, they committed adultery in your heart. Again, that's not physical adultery. It's not grounds for divorce, but it is sin before God. God sees, but in your heart, you're sinning. In your desires, you're sinning. And how important it is that we take those thoughts captive and we cast them out, remembering God sees all these different things. I don't want to offend God with my thought life. So when evil thoughts or doubts come in about God or temptations for sin, we need to cast them out in the name of Jesus. Amen? Verse 16. Then the men rose from there and looked towards Sodom. And Abraham went with them and sent them on the way. And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I am doing? Since Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. For I have known him, in order that he may command his children and his household after him, that they keep the way of the Lord, to do righteousness and justice, that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has spoken to him. And the Lord said, because the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is very grave, I'll go down now and see whether they have done altogether according to the outcry against it that has come to me. And if not, I will know. In chapter 14, the king of Sodom was defeated, but God delivered the people into Abram's hand, if you recall. He defeated them and he rescued Lot and the other people with him. 
Abram told the king that he had taken an oath before God that he would take none of the spoil from the battle except for the food that his servants ate. But the people of Sodom did not turn to the Lord. And it's something I find fascinating. We can see that they were delivered by a man of God, but they, do, they had no interest in learning anything about the God that delivered them. They just continued on in their sins. And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I am doing? This was the second part of the trip that God had made Abraham knew nothing about. God obviously came to meet with Abraham, and he came to go check out Sodom. And God in his grace reveals his plan to his servant Abraham. He gives several reasons for why he is revealing it to him. He says, since Abraham shall become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. He's an important figure, of course, in history, Abraham is. He's included in the lineage of Christ and the promise of the nation of Israel to come from him. So he's recognizing that God's God saying, this is part of the reason. Verse 19, for I have known him in order that he may command his children and his household after him, that they keep the way of the Lord, to do righteousness and justice, that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has spoken to him. So the next reason that's listed is, for I have known him. Abraham is a friend of God. He's his servant, but he knows him. John chapter 10, verse 14, Jesus talking, he says, I am the good shepherd, and I know my sheep, and am known by my own. You know, we need to remember how Abraham became friends with God. And in James chapter 2, verse 23, it says, And the scriptures was fulfilled, which says, Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. Abraham entered in this relationship with God, like you and me, by faith, the same way. And God tells Abram what he's going to do, or Abraham here, because he is his servant and because he is his friend. How awesome it is, again, that we have a personal God. You know, he didn't reveal all these things uh, to Lot. Obviously, he sent the angels to Lot and, and pulls him out in the next chapter. We'll talk about that a little bit, but mostly next week. But God is doing these things with Abraham because Abraham is a friend. And, you know, some within relationships is some friends are closer than others, aren't they? Some relationships, uh, you get much more personal with each other. And I want to ask you this morning, where is their relationship with the Lord? Is it one of those close, personal, intimate ones? Is it that one where you love God first? That's the relationship he wants with you. That's the relationship he had with Abraham. And that's what he wants us to walk in, this close personal relationship. Lastly, he tells him that he's revealing it to him so that he can teach his children. He says, in order that he may command his children and his household after him, that they keep the way of the Lord to do righteousness and justice, that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has spoken to him. Abraham, teach your children not only about my mercy, but also about my judgment. Teach them to walk rightly, lest they become like Sodom and Gomorrah. That's what he is teaching them. And Abraham did teach his children. God is still known to this day as the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, the God of Israel. So Abraham, of course, was faithful in this. And so also should all godly men take it upon themselves to teach their children the things of God, righteousness and justice. Fathers, that's you. If you got kids. You should be teaching them about the ways of the Lord. You should be teaching them righteousness and justice and the fear of God. That responsibility and that privilege falls to you. It falls to me. Godly men teach their children 
to follow God. How, what are some ways we can do this? Read to them. Read the Bible to them. Do Bible studies with them. Go through a teaching series with your kids. Read other Christian books with them and talk about it. Give them good, godly education. Teach them to do what is right because there's a God in heaven. Correct them when they're wrong. Teach them to be just because God is watching them to be accountable to their maker. We should be teaching them these things. We should be warning them about the evil of sin, the death that follows, the pain that comes with it. Fathers, teach your children to keep the way of the Lord. Embrace that responsibility. God has appointed you as the father over your children. You are adequate. You can do it. And so I want to encourage you, embrace that rule. Learn from Abraham and teach your children the things of God. Verse 20, And the Lord said, Because the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is very grave, I will go down now and see whether they have done altogether according to the outcry against it that has come to me. And if not, I will know. God knew the reports were true. He does not need to look. It's simply the righteousness of God being revealed to us. Even though God knew of their wickedness, he goes to see it before he judges. Verse 22, Then the men turned away from there and went toward Sodom. But Abraham still stood before the Lord. And Abraham came near and said, Would you also destroy the righteous with the wicked? Suppose there were 50 righteous within the city. Would you also destroy the place and not spare it for the 50 righteous that were in it? Far be it from you to do such a thing as this, to slay the righteous with the wicked, so that the righteous should be as the wicked. Far be it from you. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? The men here all turn. The, the men that turn from here are the two angels. We'll see them appear again in chapter 19. But it says, Abraham still stood before the Lord, and he came near and said, Would you also destroy the righteous? with the wicked. We see God being incredibly gracious with Abraham here. We see Abraham being very bold. But there's also some things I think we need to pull out of the text so that we're reading it right. It says, Abraham begins to talk with God in the phrase, he says, he came near. And this came near suggests more of a worship and a humble approach as he's seeking God. Uh, and so not so much of a, of a hot-headed approach. And he asked this question that's troubling him. Would you also destroy the righteous with the wicked? That's what he's asking him. Now, he begins to intercede for the city of Sodom. He begins to pray. And his focus, though I'm sure he had care for all the different people, is predominantly, though, Lord, what about those who are righteous there? What about the good? And I think that he's predominantly thinking of Lot. What about my nephew? that is there. Would you destroy the righteous with the wicked? You know, if you flip over to chapter 19 and verse 29, it says, And it came to pass when God destroyed the cities of the plain that God remembered Abraham and sent Lot out of the midst of the, of the overthrow. And when he overthrew the cities in which Lot had dwelt. God pulled Lot out. We know at least part of the reason that God pulled Lot out is because Abraham interceded. That's at least that's what it says right there. God remembered Abraham when he pulled Lot out. And he's coming here before the Lord. And in verse 24, he begins this discourse of a hypothetical question. Suppose there were 50 righteous within the city. Would you also destroy the place and not spare it for the 50 righteous that were in it? Verse 25, far be it from you to do such a thing as this, to slay the righteous with the wicked, so that the righteous should be as the wicked. Far be it from you. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? Abraham here is reminding God of his nature, and he's also revealing a common problem within man. <laughs> he, 
He's reminding God, Lord, do right, do right. Do not judge the righteous with the wicked. What is the problem here is that Abraham thought that there were some godly men in Sodom, but God knew there was only Lot. <laughs> Often, men can accuse God of being unjust. But what we find in God's gracious response to Abraham is he's incredibly merciful and just. The problem is correct understanding. As Abraham here he understands, God, you're going to destroy the city. Abraham, what about the righteous? And I think what we see in the heart of God is, I wish there was righteous. Abraham, and I think that's also why we see the grace of God and the way he deals with them, because Abraham, I think, actually had, in a lot of ways, the heart of God, though the misunderstanding. Lord, you wouldn't destroy the righteous with the wicked. And what we find from the text is the Lord's telling them, no, I would spare the city. I would spare the city, Abraham, if there was that many there. So it's an important reminder for us that if we ever think that God is doing something, we go, that's not right. Remind yourself, God is just. I must be missing something. When you look through Scripture, is there anyone who loves people, justice, righteousness, and truth more than God? Is there anyone who is more patient, compassionate, and loving than God? Our God, who took on human form and died in our place so that we could be with him forever and be spared from the flames of hell. Is anyone better than our God or more just or more merciful? So whenever a temptation comes across your heart or your mind and you look at something and you go, God, that's not, re not right. Remind yourself, God is trustworthy. God is trustworthy. And so if, you under, if you're looking at something and you go, that doesn't look like justice, then understand that you must not get the whole picture because God is just. And his dealings and his judgments are always just, whether or not you or me understand them when we see them or hear of them. Verse 26, so the Lord said, if I find in Sodom 50 righteous within the city, then I will spare all the place for their sakes. Then Abraham answered and said, Indeed, now I, who am but dust and ashes, have taken it upon myself to speak to the Lord. Again, we see here Abraham is humble. He's not hot-headed. Verse 28, suppose there were five less than 50 righteous. Would you destroy all the city for the lack of five? So he said, If I find there 45, I will not destroy it. And he spoke to him yet again and said, Suppose there should be 40 found there. So he said, I won't destroy it. For the sake of 40. Then he said, let not the Lord be angry and I'll speak. Suppose 30 should be found there. So he said, I'll not do it if I find 30 there. And he said, if indeed, uh, said, indeed now I have taken upon myself to speak to the Lord. Suppose 20 should be found there. So he said, I will not destroy it for the sake of 20. Then he said, let not the Lord be angry and I'll speak but once more. Suppose 10 should be found there. And he said, I will not destroy it for the sake of 10. So the Lord went his way. As soon as he had finished speaking with Abraham, and Abraham returned to his place. Why all the way down to 10? You know, it's possible uh, that, Ab that Lot had four daughters. We don't know how many daughters we have. In chapter 2, he has two virgin daughters. Some people think that he had two other married daughters. And so that Abraham is basically going down to 10 and going, okay, they got 10, right? They got... Four daughters, two married, the six, Abraham, uh, Lot and his wife, eight. And he was, there's got to be a couple, a few other people. So he's getting it all the way down. He's like, I basically just need Lot's family. <laughs> that's possible. We don't know that. We don't know how many kids Lot had. But that's one popular uh, idea. But either way, he gets it all the way down to 10. And God, in his grace reveals his righteousness to Abraham, not because he needed to, but because Abraham was his friend. God doesn't need to justify himself before men. He is explaining it to Abraham because he's gracious and so that he could teach his children rightly. Why was that city destroyed? 
because there was none righteous. They were given over to death. They were given over to sin. That's why. We always need to remember God is holy and just, regardless if we understand the situation. He alone is the judge over all the earth. And when we look at Sodom, it most certainly is a warning to not live wickedly. It's a, it's a picture that God is intentionally painting. It reveals to us here in this passage the heart of God. If there were even a tiny remnant, God would have spared the whole city. And we need to remember sometimes the importance of these statements, the things that God reveals to us about His ways. Remember, His ways are not our ways. And sometimes we can think things like ministry is only relevant if it impacts a lot of people. Well, if Lot had a small group at his house with just a few people in it, the the whole entire city would have been spared. If he had just a few genuine believers out of the entire city. History would have been changed if there was just a small group in Sodom. Small group of believers. If only a few of them were following God. This is not the only time, of course, in history that a city has entered this kind of sin. Uh, The prophet Jeremiah, writing about Jerusalem, chapter 5, verse 1, it says, Run to and fro through the streets of Jerusalem. See now and know. And seek in her open places, if you can find a man, if there is anyone who executes judgment, who seeks the truth, and I will pardon her. Go find one. (laughs) Jeremiah, go look. Can you find anyone in the city? When God judges a people or a person or a nation, they deserve it. And God in his grace, we see always, is trying to draw us to repentance. But when judgment comes, it is just. Truthfully, we all should know we all deserve judgment. It is by the grace of God and his mercy that any of us stands before him. You could have no worse enemy in the world than the king of the universe. And neither could you have a greater advocate. You're either for me or against me. You are on one side or the other. God has obviously given us an invitation to be with him. But those that reject him, those who want to go after the passions of the flesh, who reject his salvation, they will find themselves standing before a mighty judge, and they will be condemned. 1 John chapter 2, though, verse 1 says, My little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. We have an advocate. Like I said, we all deserve judgment. We all deserve, really, the wrath of God to be poured out on us. Each of us knows our own hearts, not even just our own actions. But remember, God sees the mind. And he knows everything you've ever even imagined or let your heart desire. But within those things, we have an advocate. Who is the we here that says that we have an advocate? Who is the we that he's talking about? It's those who have confessed their sins and placed their faith in Christ. Just like Abraham was made righteous by faith, so are we. And I want to encourage you this morning, if you have not placed your faith in Christ, then I invite you this morning, come now and know the mercy of God. Be made clean from your sins, flee from the coming wrath, and instead receive God's grace. There's a day of judgment coming that came on Sodom in a time they didn't expect it. I think that's how it comes on all the ungodly. Death comes when a time you're not expecting it. And after that, the judgment. What should you do? Repent. Repent. Let your sins be washed away by the blood of Christ and have an advocate, a mighty advocate on your behalf, Jesus Christ. Confess your sins. Ask the Lord to pay for them with his his blood. Begin to walk with him as Abraham did. Amen? For those who are already walking with the Lord also this morning, we're going to take communion here in just a few minutes. And I want to encourage you to be thankful for the salvation that he's given us. 
I want to encourage you to worship him during the time of communion, that he is both righteous and merciful. Thank you, God. Praise him because he is both powerful and loving. He holds the keys to the bottomless pit, but he'd prefer us to dwell in his presence as his family. And let us also learn from Abraham's example and let us run to him to fellowship with him daily. You know, if there's anything in your life right now that it's a hindrance, that you know it's holding you back, you hear the Lord knocking at the door, but you're sitting on the couch and you're holding something in your hands and you don't want to let it go. Run to him. Run to him. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and dine with him and he with me. Thank you, Lord, that he wants this personal relationship with us. And let's joyfully walk in it. Amen. Lord, we come before you. I thank you, Father for your word. Lord, I thank you that you have come to us. I thank you that you have made a way for us to be saved. I thank you that you reveal yourself, Lord, to us as fallen people. And Lord, in the midst of our fallenness, Lord, as we reflect on your righteousness, Lord, that you have made a payment for our sins, that we might live with you forever. Lord, satisfying your righteous judgment, but also, Father, allowing us, Lord, to be the objects of your love and your mercy and your benevolence, to be a part of your family, to enjoy you forever. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your love towards us. Lord, I thank you that just as Abram or Abraham, Father, got to dine with you, Lord, I thank you that one day we will get to dine with you that we will get to see you face to face. Lord, I pray that you would help us, Lord, to keep our eyes fixed on you. Lord, as we look at Abraham, Lord, and he stumbled, Lord, we thank you for your grace at different times when we stumble. But Lord, we also learn, Lord, that as he's, at the times, Lord, that he is meeting. From creation to the cross, There from the cross into eternity.